Welcome everyone to the Mercury panel on product market fit. Today, we're going to have a fun and hard hitting discussion with three uh, certified experts of product market fit in that they have got it. Some have, have got it multiple times. So, you know, I will say when you do something once, you never know, but when you do something twice, you know, you can repeat it. Um, so that's good news. Let me um, kick every, kick this off by introducing everyone and then we'll get into the questions. Please post your questions uh, via the Q&A feature and we'll spend the last 20 minutes of the discussion going through them. And no holds barred. Um, these are these are the folks that you wanted to talk to. We've got them here with us. So whatever's on your mind, please ask it. Imad is someone that I've known forever. Um, Imad is, of course, the founder of Mercury, uh, the bank that hopefully all of you are using much, much better than Silicon Valley Bank. I can tell you having used them, uh, at least for my last startup. I know uh, Imad from running a company in the mobile gaming space called Hazat. Um, I built a company similar to that, and you know we were always impressed and amazed by how quickly they built and shipped product and sort of navigated the idea maze and eventually got to something that got to really high scale. So um, Imad has done this a couple of times, and you know I've always uh, appreciated all of his wisdom on on the journey and um, and also his sort of chill demeanor. So thank you, Imad. Um, we've also got Rahul. Rahul is a founder of Superhuman, hopefully the email client that all of you are using probably one of the buzziest products um, that has maintained that buzz that I've seen in many, many years in consumer and well justified the buzz because it's, you know, it's something that I probably spend more time in than any other product. Um, so welcome Rahul. And Rahul, of course, famously penned an article talking about his process for finding market fit, which we'll talk about today. Whoops. And then Gene has a, uh, a company called Akita, which is a very cool dev tools company that will help you identify which API of the many API calls you're certainly calling uh, is the slowest and how to you know, deliver um, an improved experience to your customers as fast as possible. Um, she's fantastic. She's done this as a, a sort of expert academic and, and now she's a founder. So she's walking the walk and we're excited to hear from her today on you know, what are, what, what's the delta between sort of where she uh, saw product market fit potential when she began and, and where she is today. So thank you all. Well, let's kick it off um, by talking a little bit about product market fit. I mean, I'd love for you each to talk to me about one, you know, what was what is product market fit in your mind? And more importantly, what is it not? Because I think a big challenge in finding product market fit is knowing what it's not. And, you know, just the psychology, which we will talk about of not having product market fit is a real challenge. So, Imad, why don't we start with you? I think what it is not is quite a good question. Um uh, it's actually, I think, an amalgamation of like a set of things coming together that like gets your business to scale fast. Uh, so that is like distribution, retention, like good kind of uh, unit economics around that. Uh, and then like a scalability of those kind of channels, let's say. Uh, so I'll give you an example that, yeah, it is not. Uh, early in Hayes app, uh, we figured out that like if you put a button uh, inside like other mobile games that said check-in, uh, you would get a lot of distribution for the Haze app, mobile app, which is what it, what it was at the time. It was a social network. So we had like a ton of users uh, that scaled to like 10 million installs. And we thought that was product market fit. We were like, wow, we're getting all these users, but like no one stuck around. <laughs> so we were like super excited about it. We were like, we found product market fit. We were like, you know, really like drumming the drums of success or whatever. Uh, so anyway, distribution by itself is not product market fit. It's like one thing I would say. It is not, um, at least from my personal experience. Very interesting. And Gene, over to you. How do you define product market fit and how is it different from how you thought it would be when you started the journey? Um, I, I agree with Ahmad. It's, it's, it's all the pieces. People have to want it, then they have to use it, then they have to pay for it. And uh, what I learned it's not is just people wanting it. So when I first started Akita, um, we had built something that people, you know, they'd be like, wow, that's so amazing. We had this demo that um, we were building this thing that fuzzed your APIs, told you where all the data went. And, you know, they would, they, they would, I would do a call with them. They would love the demo. They'd bring like everybody that they knew from their company to the demo. They would get all these people inv involved because they're like, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. And then when it actually came down to installing it, um, you know, months and months dragged by and it wasn't getting installed um, in part because it 
it was it was a complex install, which, you know, I could have made that excuse for many months more. But I was just like, if they really wanted to make this happen, they would. And um, that was, you know, just I could, you know, my, my team was like, but you so many people are coming to this meeting and look, look, look at look at their titles and all this stuff. And I realized that that's just that's not enough. Very good. Fantastic. And then Rahul, maybe, um, you know, tell us, of course, what your definition is, but then also elaborate on the point Gene made, which is you guys are a paid product. You know, how do you know that what's the delta between and how important is it to get people to pay? Yeah, well, let me start there on the paid side. Personally, I think it's extremely important. Uh, So much so that for superhuman, our first 10 users were unsurprisingly investors. But what may surprise you is that even for them, I insisted that they pay the full retail $30 per month price. Uh, this was many, many years ago before the product did all it did today, and it you know fell over every now and then. And that was because I wanted to keep ourselves intellectually honest that, hey, is this actually something that you would pay $30 a month for? Are you genuinely saving the hours per week that we are setting out to achieve? So I think charging, if ultimately your plan is to make money by charging users, is super important. I would definitely advise doing that from the get-go so you don't lull yourself into a false sense of product market fit. The zooming way out, what actually is it? There's obviously lots of lenses here. I completely agree with Ahmad's take that it is an amalgam of different things. And there are lots of ways you can measure this. Uh, We're going to get into that uh, in in a little bit. Uh, What I want to touch on, though, is a little bit of how it feels and how that can sometimes maybe be a a false sign. Uh, So different people have opined on this. Sam Altman is famous for saying, um, you know, you you think you, you may think you have it when users spontaneously tell other people to use your product, meaning you didn't have to ask your users to be viral. They're being viral by themselves. I will say that is good, but it is not uh, sufficient. It probably is necessary, though. Uh, why is it not sufficient? I think history is uh, given us plenty of examples, especially in the social space of products that are here one year, they're gone next. You can create a very buzzy product that gets a high degree of virality, but actually, in retrospect, some of those things turn out not to have product market fit. So that's only part of the puzzle. Uh, Paul Graham, obviously famous for saying, make something people want. Again, it's necessary. Uh, sorry, I always get that the wrong way around. It's necessary, but not sufficient. It's only part of the puzzle. Uh, I think Mark Andreessen's done a really good job of characterizing this. You know it when you have it. Uh, you know, customers are buying as fast as uh, you can add servers. You're hiring sales and support as fast as you can. Uh, cash is piling up in your checking account. Reporters are constantly wanting to speak to you. Investors keep wanting to invest. But the problem with that definition is it's a post hoc thing. Uh, but that's right. probably the best definition I found. Like, you know, you clearly know when you have it. Uh, and a lot of what I've spent the last few years thinking about is how can you sequence the steps to getting there? And I'd love for you to talk about that, actually, Rahul. I mean, tell it because a big part of this, as you said, what is the feeling of product market fit? That all sounds wonderful. And I'm sure we all wish to experience that someday, but it's abstract, you know? So you start to have some of those good feelings. Some of your customers and your friends start to ask for the product. They want to be on the alpha list. They want to be in the test flight. Like, how do you know that that's, is it intuition? Is it, I know you have a system, but just talk about the system and then how the intuition connects to it. We do have a framework uh, and you can Google this right now. It's called the product market fit engine. It's on first round review. That said, it is built on a foundation of intuition. Uh, so I vividly remember the scene. It was um, we we founded the company roughly 2015, and for the first two years of the company, we were just writing code. Superhuman, like many productivity and collaboration tools, has an absurdly large surface area of stuff you just have to build in order even to have someone be able to switch away from Gmail or Office 365, let alone actually be good at any one thing in particular. There's a very high switching cost that we have to meet. And so I always knew going in, it was going to be a very, very high build. Uh, but Anish, to your point, you're, you're starting to get these feelings. You've got a you know a very long wait list maybe, uh, or perhaps the press has gotten wind of what you're doing and they're starting to write uh, articles uh, based on what you're doing. And 
Uh, or, or maybe you're just feeling like you're running out of time. And that's definitely how I felt two years in when my team were coming to me and saying, hey, we need to launch this thing. Uh, but I deep down intuitively knew that we wouldn't have product market fits. Like it wouldn't end up like Mark Andreessen describes it. it. It would actually probably have been the opposite. But I also knew as a leader, it's not particularly great to just say to your team, hey, trust my intuition. This is going to go horribly wrong if we launch this. Right now, it's kind of like your opinion versus theirs. And especially if you have 10 people who really think you should, you should launch the thing and you're the only person in the company who thinks you shouldn't, that's not a really great place to be. Uh, so that's why I looked for a very systematic, metrics-driven, framework-oriented way to actually measure products market fit. And to get away from some of the problems that Net Promoter Score or Sam Altman's take, which is, you know, users spontaneously telling other users have. And we ended up in a, uh, with a metric that was popularized by Sean Ellis. You may not know that name, not as famous as the other folks I just mentioned, uh, but he is famous for coining the term growth hacker. And he came up with this question um, that you probably, most people on this call may have heard by now. How would you feel if you could no longer use the product? And you get people to say very disappointed, meaning they, they would be very sad. Some are disappointed and not disappointed. And it turns out, he benchmarked this on hundreds of internet companies, that if you have more than 40% very disappointed, you are very likely to have products market fit. And if you try to grow, you are likely to succeed. Uh, and if you don't have that metric and you try to grow, you're also likely to fail. So he, he found it was predictive both ways in a way that was much more compelling than Net Promoter Score. Uh, so that's what uh, I ended up finding. Uh, and then we built a whole algorithm on top of that to actually systematically increase that product market fit score. And it turns out that if you want to go like the full nine yards on this, uh, you can actually use this to systematically generate a roadmap that will make that number go up over time. And that's what we did at Superhuman. So, um, you know, definitely was not an overnight success. Uh, I'm many, many years into the company at this point. And I remember at that time when the team was saying, hey, we should launch this thing. I came back to them and I said, this is our plan. We measured the number and we were like 22% very disappointed. That is bad. That's almost like you should maybe go and do another company bad. <laughs> um, but we systematically increased it. So we went from 22% to 30% to 50 to like 55% over the course of three or four courses. Got it. Lovely. That, that's so helpful because there's nothing more frustrating to hear. Like you'll know it when you see it. It's like, well, okay, I've never seen it. So how will I really know? Um, Gene, I love that you mentioned team role. Gene, I know you had some thoughtful takes on how to manage the team, how to hire for the pre-product market fit team. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you've done that at Akita? Yeah. So I, I will say that I am a lot of the hiring advice I had gotten prior to Akita was sell people on a dream and tell them what you're going to do and then hire people for it. And I quickly realized you can't do that if you're a pre-product market fit company because you sell people on one dream and one plan and they show up and they're like, all right, cool. I'm ready to do that plan. It's very dis disorienting if you have to change that plan. And so what I learned is that, um, and you know, I, I had uh, like one of my earliest hires, Hires showed up and like one week later left because they were like, I, I thought this was just going to be the plan. And one weekend, I was like, let's, let's examine the plan. And he was just like, oh my God, like, I, can't, I can't do this. And so uh -huh. what I learned is um, you sell people on the dream, like the dream needs to stay the same, but actually being very explicit about, okay, this is what we know. This is what we don't know. This is what we're going to test. And if their response is, what do you mean test? I thought this was the plan. Uh, mm -hmm. That is that is not, not a good person company fit. Um, and um, and what, what you really need is, is people who uh, are in it for the dream, but are flexible to the plans. And um, some, something else that um, has has really been a process is there's there's this balance, and I, I'd love to hear from Raul and Ahmad about this. When you're building to that that full first product uh, of having people believe that what they're doing is leading somewhere without having them get so attached to it that if you um you know if if, if you have to throw away that part of the product, no one is too sad. And um, for us, it was just constantly reiterating the vision, like we're going here. This is why we're doing it. This is what we're testing. Um, and if a test didn't pan out, it's like, all right, like we still have everything else is the same, except you're doing something else now. 
Imad, can you comment on this as well? You've done it twice. Yeah, I think the key is to keep your team small before product market fit. I think it's super dangerous. And I actually worry about a lot of these companies that raise a lot of money in seed. Uh, my experience has been like above eight ish people, like, you know, I think it's not just the type of person, it's like the trust and camaraderie you have around it. Like you're all in the same room, everyone's, uh, you yeah, know, at least before remote, but yeah, everyone's like hearing these conversations and then like everyone's so bored in that like they know it's not working. And then when you think of a pivot or like a change in direction or whatever, everyone's like, sure, yeah, this is obvious, right? As soon as you go to like 15 people, completely different environment, like getting things to change is like a real, you know, we did four pivots at Hazap. So it was, <laughs> I had this like experience <laughs> over and over and I was like, yeah, there's just a certain team size where it's just like change is super hard to do. Uh, so that's, I think, one aspect to it. But I think another aspect, which is like kind of this like vague cultural term, it's just like, you know, how much are people like really enjoying the experience, right? If it's, if they're like, bought in and they're like part of like this kind of yeah you know like let's work together and they're enjoying just the work together aspect of it then like uh if you can build a culture like that then you know the fact that you change what you're actually working on doesn't matter as much right like i know there is this kind of like somewhat I don't, I don't know if it's a trope but the, there's a thing in the valley where it's like oh you know get mission driven people and i get that and you should get mission driven people but but I think the reality is most people's work experiences, like who you're working with and how you're working with them. And if you can make that like a really great experience for people, like not like faking it, but like they just genuinely enjoy working with each other, uh, that will like paper over like difficult times and uh, and like these kind of changes that come. That makes a lot of sense. I love that. And how was your approach different between the two companies, defining product market fit or, or managing the team or any of it? I mean, it was so drastically different. I actually think, I think a lot of companies have very different approaches. And if they hear one person's story, then they might get a bit hung up on it. So in my previous company, like we launched something and we mm -hmm. just literally, it was, it was an ad tech. Uh, so I won't like bore you with what it was, but you know, we literally had a sales team of five-ish people that were like very product focused salespeople. And they just say like, we need, here's all the sales leads and these are the features they need. And we were like, okay, you know, here's a common feature that the biggest uh, companies need. And we would just build that. And then a month later, we would do the same exercise and would say, oh, why aren't they using it? And if they're using it, I was like, okay, good. Like that feature worked. And we just went like, we had like an, basically an, we launched something kind of crappy and we had a nine month process where we just kept building like the top feature that the biggest companies we could get to needed. And like after nine months, we had like pretty strong product market fit. So it was like very much more of the MVP and iterate approach and be very customer focused. Uh, and it wasn't like obvious that we were getting to product market fit. I mean, we didn't have like a Rahul's nice framework uh, to work with. But, you know, by the end of it, it, was, it, it, like there was a point where it like suddenly flipped from like our sales team having to bring everyone in to like, you know, every week someone just like coming in and we were like, who the hell are they? And they were like, you know, it was a self-service product as well. And they were like, became the biggest app that was using uh, the Haze app. So like, that was like kind of my mental flip. I was like, whoa, like where'd they come from kind of thing. Uh, so a little bit of like kind of Sam Altman's kind of take there. Um, at Mercury, it was, you know, it was pretty different. Like I knew what the problems were at a bank. And there was similar to Rahul, there was like pretty high bar of like, here's all the things to build and here's mm -hmm. how to make them better. We spent a year and a half kind of building them and we launched as soon as we had all the features. Uh, well, probably a little bit before we had all the features and it was like kind of like very obvious product market fit from like the first week we launched. I have this like funny story where like four days after we launched, someone I'd never met or spoken to like sent a million dollars to a Mercury bank account. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I just thought they were completely crazy. You know, like, it's like, a, imagine seeing a startup on Twitter and then signing up for a bank account and then sending a million dollars within like four days. Uh, I was like pretty impressed by that person. I should really look up who it is and say hi to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You should bring them a, a giant check or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So this is a great point. You mentioned metrics for all talk about for incremental features you launch. How do you know if they're working, if they're like, do you, are you trying to understand if they're contributing to the product market fit or are they very narrowly focused on a metric you want to drive or is it more intuition based? 
This is probably something that we don't do particularly well. But then also I'd caveat it by saying, and, and you would know this as a superhuman customer, it's it's kind of a gestalt product. Like superhuman gives you a holistic sensation and you, you definitely save hours per week. But it's actually kind of difficult for a customer to articulate it's precisely this thing, this feature that makes that true. I don't think every product is like that. Uh, it sounds like the, the approach that Imad took, for example, at HeyZap was let's build the most requested thing and let's keep walking down that list. Uh, and I think in many cases, especially in B2B software, that's actually fairly likely to work. It doesn't always work because you can have uh, different customers of different types with different propensities to pay, pulling you in different areas and you might be spread too thin. So definitely watch out for that risk. Uh, but in B2C, and I would characterize superhuman as sort of B2C to B, we are adopted by individuals, usually for an individual email problem before we sell to the enterprise. It's much more challenging to sort of tie it to any one feature or, or any one thing. So we were much more vision driven. We had an approach of we're going to build the fastest email experience in the world. It's going to save you hours per week. And we're going to split that up into sort of two parallel streams of activity. Number one, doubling down on the things that users love about the products. And in the products market fit engine, we figured out that those things were speed and keyboard shortcuts and the overall design and the aesthetics. But that's only half of our effort. The other half of the effort goes into systematically building or overcoming objections, but only for the subset of users who were somewhat disappointed, meaning that they didn't love the product. They also... Mm -hmm. um, were not disappointed. They weren't a million miles from knowing for the product. But then a subset of those users, only those for whom the main benefits of the product resonated. And the idea here is, <clears throat> especially if you're doing B2C-ish things, you know, you're going to have tens of thousands of users. How do you know who to listen to? You may have millions if you've gone freemium. The way that you know, the way that you can figure out who to listen to is who are the somewhat disappointed users for whom the main benefit resonates? Systematically work down that list, uh, and you can mathematically show, and this happened to us, that the size of the pie that is very disappointed without your product will just keep on going up over time. And so if you believe in the metric, you'll make the metric go up. What a great answer. That makes a lot of sense. Gene, how much do you listen to your customers? Do they sort of guide you as to what to build next, or are you intuition-led, or is it a mix? Uh, we're completely uh, user led. So we, um, well, after, I, I will say, after we realized that demoing to high titles was not the way to go, um, we pivoted into this situation where um, a lot of users were showing up to our website saying, hey, what you're saying on the website is uh, really what we're about. We had very little product then. We had like, you know, a demo, we had this very basic API discovery tool. And um, on day one, a bunch of users showed up and I just had calls with all of them. And I was like, hey, like, who are you? Where did you come from? They're, they were from all kinds of different countries companies I'd never heard of before. And um, I just asked them what your pro like what are your problems and what do you want me to do for you? Um, and what what I learned was um, people telling you their, their problems is usually very accurate. And people telling you what they want you to do is usually highly inaccurate. And so people have a, a very um, anytime anyone has had a feature request that's you know like you give them a feature they're like what like I asked for this and you're like yeah you asked for this. Um, but you know people People, people are, are, are usually pretty, pretty self-aware about problems. If you walk through, like, you know, tell me, tell, you know, tell me what the problem is. Is this really the problem? Let's walk through your whole, your whole uh, flow of, you know, the tools you use, stuff like that. Like people are very good at answering those kind of questions. But when it comes to like, I want this feature, um, I usually have a checklist of, you know, is it blocking? It's you, like 90% of the time, the answer is no, I just want it. Um, but um, why, why do you want it? That's usually, a, for me, a much more informative question than, uh, you know, like what you actually want. And and, and our, our team spends a lot of time thinking about like zooming out, like everyone's at, like, people have asked for these 10 things. Are they really the same thing? Do we have something missing in our product? Um, and um, 
you know, are people really not using parts of the product because they don't have this? And so, you know, we've instrumented the heck out of our, our actual usage to match it up with what people are saying. So if any of our users are out there, like I, I, we listen to all of you, <laughs> what we've learned is if we take everything verbatim, it doesn't seem to actually uh, be what makes, makes everyone the happiest. We, we've really learned to, to kind of um, weight different things differently and ask questions in, in the most helpful ways for us. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. Really, really interesting. Okay, let, let's go through one or two more questions and then let's go to Q&A from some of the folks in the audience. So Imad, over to you on who you listen to. You know, there's the question of listening to your customers, but there's also what advice do you listen to as a founder? There's just so much advice out there. There's business books. I mean, it feels like there's an entire advice industry. So how do you sort of tell what is signal and what is noise and how has that changed over time? That's a great question. Uh, I think the key to advice is like not listen to advice literally, but like understand how that person thought and came up with the answer and try to then apply the thinking, which is like a lot trickier. Uh, Like take uh, like Rahul's thing. Like I think there's definitely like an element. And I remember doing this as an early entrepreneur where you take it like too literally and you'd say, okay, like let's start measuring this and but. uh, and like, maybe it could be the right thing to do. Uh, but like, you might end up wasting a lot of time and it just like, didn't make sense for you in that particular time in that particular position. Like maybe you're just an enterprise startup and like, it doesn't quite make sense to measure, uh, measure it when you have so many stakeholders. Anyway, uh, I think like really spending, a, if you're going to take on advice and you should, and there's so much to learn from nowadays and that's amazing, but you should really spend extra time. Like I try to get multiple opinions on a thing. So like, you know, if there's a, like recently I was reading about OKRs because we wanted to do something similar at at our company. And I read like two books about it and I read, you know, read some blog posts about it and I tried to understand like why decisions were made within it and then came up with how to apply it. Uh, so I really think it's worth going like deeper and really understand why things are done the way they're done. And I think that's the way to understand advice. Like don't take it literally, basically. Got it. Very, very helpful. Anything to add, Jean Rowe? Um, I'll just uh, add a quick thing, which is I think advice is like data. You can always find advice to fit to the outcome you want. Mm. Um, And so you kind of have to go with your gut on what's the right situation for you. But if there's no advice that agrees with you, maybe you should do something else. That's a great point. I love that. Super well said. Okay, let, let's jump over to the Q&A and do a couple of questions here. So here's a question. I'll, I'll sort of leave it open to you three as to who, who will respond to it. The question is, I'm in a phase where I have to choose between building my software product faster or building it in a manner that will enable us to scale quickly without rework. How would you make the trade-off? I mean, we'd have to know a little bit more, but I think assuming this is pre-product market fit, like always go for speed. I'll, I'll give one counter example just because it's probably interesting is uh, we I had to make that choice at the start of Superhuman and I made the opposite choice that we were going to build a beautiful, high reliability, high quality email client up front, even before I knew we had product market fit. And the only case when you might want to consider doing it that way is if it's very hard, sometimes impossible, to reverse engineer those things back in. Uh, I think it's really hard to take a product that is low quality, slow, uh, or unreliable, and then fix those three things after the fact. It can be done, but you're going to fight culture, you're going to fight code, you may end up having to throw the whole thing away and rewriting it again. Uh, but generally, I would go with Mods I love it. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, Mod, you specifically talked about not scaling the team early. And I think that that is a, a huge anti-pattern that we see as investors, you know, a sort of uh, get ahead scale that then becomes unmanageable when you have to pivot. Great. Um, all right. Here's another interesting question from John. Um, can market fit be planned for ahead of time or is it like being hit by a bus? Hopefully not exactly like being hit by a bus, but um I often hear the phrase early signs of product market fit as an excuse for over hiring and over automating. Um, sounds like John has a point of view here, but we'd love to hear yours. Gene, why don't you start? Um, 
I mean, for us, I think like any, everything we planned for was not, not exactly the thing we expected. And it was very much about listening to the market, listening to the users and ending up somewhere where I did not exactly predict in the beginning. Um, and so I, I think in, in my case, but it's, it's really a data point of one year. Um, no. And I think if we had stuck to our plans, we would be in a much worse place right now. Um, so I agree with Ahmad, like, um, keep the team as lean as possible and get things in users' hands as quickly as possible because what they what they want to do with it is uh might be very different than uh than than what you thought they would want to do with it. Got it. Anything to add, Imad? Roll? No. Well, here's a good one for you. So what is the right moment at which to ask users that they'll be very disappointed if they can't use your product? For example, if you release an MVP with a limited feature set, that's presumably not the right time. Is there a right time? Is it a moving target or, or is it very specific, uh, case specific? The rule of thumb I have here is once the user has had the chance to experience the core value proposition of whatever it is that your product or service does. Uh, so let's take some easy examples. Let's say it was Uber. I'd probably ask them just after they've uh, finished their first ride, uh, or in the case of Airbnb, just after they've stayed at their first stay. Uh, because at that point, they've experienced the core value proposition. They're, they've just felt it. They're able to intuit their answer to the question, how would you feel? Sometimes I see folks getting this wrong by asking before that point or asking way after that point. And before that point, they they don't have the context and way after that point, they may have forgotten or they might have started to get annoyed by the bugs, et cetera, that, that your product may have. So at Superhuman, we wait for about two or three weeks and there are some other criteria. So for example, I think it's something along the lines of a certain amount of time has elapsed and also you've sent more than 20, 30 emails certain number of shortcuts, et cetera, you have experienced the core value proposition, we think, by that point. Uh, so you're likely to know whether or not the product is going to resonate for you. If you think that your MVP is early enough that users can't experience the core value prop, then I wouldn't bother asking. On the other hand, if you think that your MVP is good enough that they can experience the core value prop, even if there's broken edges around that, it's probably worth starting to ask the question. Raul, are you still measuring uh, this, even though you're post product market fit? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's and and I think we'll we'll get onto this maybe a, a later on. But one of the, I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have about product market fit is once you have it, you'll always have it. Right? That is not true. <laughs> you can totally lose it. There's lots of ways you can lose it. Uh, people may initially think about competitors, that's actually the least likely way you lose it. I think the most likely way you lose it is as you grow, something about your go-to-market motion or the type of user you have, type of customer you have, changes. And um, you know, you know, for us, one, one huge change that's happened over the last few years is we don't one-to-one -one concierge onboard every single customer. Uh, we did famously in the early days do that. And that allowed us to make up for shortcomings with many shortcomings within the product. So there was no first time user experience as a huge example. Uh, and now it's more like uh, 60, 40 uh, or 70, 30, depending on the week's self-service to uh, concierge, uh, simply because we are intending to grow so much faster these days. So um, yeah, we still measure it. We have measured it every single uh, every single customer that's ever used the product has been surveyed about two or three weeks in since the start of the company because we're constantly making shifts to either the user or the onboarding experience. Uh, we're going to be fiddling with pricing this year. Uh, and each of these things can change the product market fit equation. Super interesting. Uh, like falling out of love, as someone in the chat says. Imad, Gene, what do you say? Give us the counterpoint. Let's make this spicy. I agree with that, to be honest. <laughs> I think actually the the trickiest thing with product market fit is like, like it's not quite like this binary thing because you have it with one set of like customers and the, you know, there's this other graph like the, or like early adopter crossing the chasm kind of thinking. So you kind of have to like, for every piece of that graph, there's a separate product market fit equation. Uh, so it's actually like kind of a matrix rather than like a kind of binary thing. You can have it in like a, 
you could have it in a very, very niche set of people. Uh, you could have amazing product market fit, but like maybe it's just a tiny market, right? So uh, it is like nuanced. How do you know if that's the case though, Iman? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, like you can just see who is actually signing up and like get a feeling for like, oh, it turns out that like, you know, you thought your market was X, but it turns out that like a very small version of X is signing up or something right. like that, I think. I think that's probably the interesting way to do it. I think actually the, you know, one of the best versions of product market fit is like if it works really, really well in a niche, but like very fast growing market. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually like the Haze app product, like we had product market fit with indie game publishers. Like that was like the thing that it worked super well for. And it turned out like that year, like indie game publishers, like completely went from like not that important to like dominating the app stores. Uh, and yeah, that was kind of useful because we grew with them. Love it. Imad, here's a question on brand that I think is interesting. So, you know, Mercury is a bank, a bank like product. And, you know, you were talking about someone wiring you a million dollars. You know, you sort of have the highest bar for earning your customers' trust. So, can you just talk about, you know, when you have a product like that, how do you do it? And then, and really, how important is brand? It feels like Mercury has got one of the best startup brands, is one of the most trusted by some of you know the, the largest financial sums that are out there. How did you establish that and how important was it pre-product market fit? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's like different, like trust is not like one thing, it's like built over time with like various things. So I think like a few things that are maybe a little counterintuitive, like uh, being like really polished on the onboarding experience, like helps us win a lot of trust. Uh, you know, if people see bugs or things don't work quite right, I think that erodes trust a lot. Whereas like ours was like really, you know, surprisingly good. Uh, and that would surprise people and people like, oh, you know, if this is so solid, like the rest must be really good. That's one thing. Uh, a second thing is like really thinking and caring and investing in customer support. So at the start, it was just like me and my co-founder were like just answering calls and emails and all this stuff all the time. Uh, and that made people feel like, great. They're like, okay, you know, if something goes wrong, like I can talk to this CEO. And uh, even now in like Twitter, I respond to people all the time if they have issues. And uh, so that engenders trust. Uh, uh, number three is like, I call like transitive trust, basically like, you know, we're funded by Andreessen Horowitz. And like, especially mm -hmm. at the start, I did a ton of these podcasts and I try to, you know, say, hey, there's other people that you trust that also like at least talk to me, <laughs> if not trust me. Uh, and actually we had 60 angel investors uh, and many of them were like kind of uh, relatively well-known people. So uh, so that was like a way of like trying to gain trust. But yeah, I do really think it's like not one thing. It's like a, a series of things. And like now people think, you know, sometimes people call like it brand or community or whatever. And like these things are not like necessarily like a single thing. It's like all the little things that you do that like win people's trust. Rahul, have you faced that when you actually go sell an enterprise and they say, oh, we've never, our IT team's never heard of superhuman and you're asking, you know, us to trust them with our most sensitive information. How do you get over that objection? Initially to the first part, yes. Uh, we're fortunately now at the point where most IT teams have heard of us. But I think that's going to be typical for a bottoms up PLG company. The IT teams are going to hear about it from their individual users before we have the conversation with them. Uh, how do we get trust? Uh, you know, the, all of the things Ahmad just mentioned uh, definitely help. Transitive trust, uh, your angel investors, um, amazing customer support. Some things you can also do, build a great brand. Uh, the controversially at the time, maybe it makes sense in retrospect, the very first thing I spent money on at Superhuman was the domain name superhuman.com. And I'd only raised $700,000 at the time, and it cost $175,000. And not every founder would make that trade-off. Uh, I, I believed I could raise more money, which helped. But it was also, I wanted every possible customer, and actually at the time, more every possible candidate that I was trying to hire to trust that we quote unquote, meant business, that we were in it for the long haul, that we were going to try our hardest, uh, and that that this was going to become 
uh, you know, a company for the ages that they could really trust their email data with. Uh, so I think branding is helpful. Uh, and I think that applies not just to your company name and not just to your domain name, but to your website, how it looks, how it feels. Uh, we don't have to get into the details now, but there are clearly some looks and feels that are more trustworthy than others. Uh, and it also applies to your product marketing copy. Uh, that's actually, even if you're not necessarily a talented visual designer, or if you don't have one on the team, uh, most founders will be able to take whatever copy you have now, look at it and say, okay, how can I make this more trustworthy? Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, last thing I'd just add is there are some just tick, tick box things that you can do. Like, uh, are you stock two compliant? Uh, do you have a white paper on your security? Can you point to other lighthouse customers that uh, other IT teams will look at and go, uh, okay, yeah, well, um, such and such company is using it, therefore it's fine. And by the way, there are ways that you can hack that process. So to riff off uh, Imar's 60 well-known angel investors approach, super good approach. We did it too. You should definitely go and do that. Try and get the CEOs of your ideal customers to be investors in your company. Then you might have a little bit of an easier way in when you try and eventually one day sell them to use your product. And then hopefully if those companies are well-known companies, you can point to them and say, well, XYZ companies use our product uh, and they're really well known. So maybe you should too. Th this is all just hustle, right? Like it's all ways to, to, to try and build on all the other things you're doing. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. The social proof element is is striking and, and very effective. Gene, do you think about brand? I mean, do you think about developer brand or do you feel like if it works, you, you'll earn their trust? Um, I think brand is extremely important to us. Um, I think one of our biggest external costs is the fractional design firm we work with. Um, brand for developers is very different, um, but people do also want to know they can trust you with um, with their code. A big question we used to get in the beginning is how do we know you'll still be around? Because it is a big commitment to monitor your system using something and that monitoring tool goes away. All of a sudden you're losing one to two quarters, kind of switching your whole team around to something else. And so... Um, for us, um, I think that, you know, developers don't really care about who your investors are. They don't care if your CEO or if their CEO cares about you. But what they want to know is that you have attention to detail, that they can talk to you if there's any problem. Um, I think there's, you know, certain other developers, they kind of listen to, but, you know, developers are very, uh, there, there's, there's very different, different ways, um, influence happens there. But for us, a big thing was, um, you know, we're, we're looking at pretty potentially sensitive data. So they install an agent in their systems and we see all of their API traffic. Um, the biggest thing there was we were very transparent and I, I think we could probably do a better, better job of this of just explaining like we architected our system so that we actually never send your traffic to us. Um, we've gotten around not being SOC 2 compliant yet for that reason. We have, you know, like letters, we send lawyers and things like that. But, um, just people really trusting us technically and to, you know, do our best has actually gotten us into places where we like we really had no business getting this this early. What a great answer. Really helpful. Developer trust is just as important. All right. We've got one more from the chat here. So question to you all. So I'll let whoever take this. Um, can you talk about the journey in finding ICPs to zoom in at the early stage of finding market fit? Um, how do you find out the best channels to reach your potential ICPs? When did you know they are the right ones um, versus, you know, probably not quite and you need to move on? I mean, the easiest trick to it is if you are your own ICP, uh, which I did not manage previously, but at Mercury, I was like selling to startup founders and early stage startup founders, which I had been for years. So I think that if you do that, then you know where channels you sit in, you know how to talk to them. Uh, it's not always possible, obviously, but I do think that's like the the like the like easy hack if you can be your <laughs> own kind of customer. Gene, what do you think? Were, were you actually facing this problem yourself or what was your story of the sort of earned secret? Um, so inside? this is, we're, we're still honing our ICP. Um, you know, I think a lot of it for us, uh, because we're taking this bottom-up product-led 
approach, it's really about who, who shows up and finds us. And so it was very much about me getting to know who was showing up, why, um, what do they want? So we had, you know, anywhere from very small startups to very large companies showing up. Um, and then it was a narrowing of like, okay, the larger companies all want custom stuff. It's going to take us like three years to build this. We do not have the team to support it. The smaller companies, we, we like some of the smaller companies, we interviewed them and they're like, yeah, we'll pay you about as much as we pay for GitHub. And I'm just like, this doesn't even co- cover our operating costs. And so, you know, then, then we're like, okay, the companies with a budget size that do not require the customization that, you know, would, would lead us to hire a much bigger team that that ended up being our ICP, but it was really a process of seeing who showed up on their own. Cause I, I didn't want, you know, I wanted to be bottom up. I, I believe we were stickiest that way. And also if you just look at, look at cost of customer acquisition, like you want, you want to be doing this in developer tools if you can. Um, and then just seeing what their, what their requirements and asks were and budgets. Got it. Super helpful. Budget's key. Yes. Um, okay, here's here's an interesting one on competition for Imad and Rahul. You know, how, how do you if you're not building a network effects product, which most companies are not these days, how much do you think about competition from incumbents, from startups, or do you sort of do the Amazon thing and just fully focus on your customers? I am happy gen- to oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was waiting. I'm really interested in Rahul's answer to this. Uh I would I'm of the general opinion that like, you know. Um, you should ignore your competition. Uh, I've always had like a boogeyman competitor in my startup journey. And like, you know, uh, 99% of the time, like, yeah, you die from like suicide, no homicide is, <laughs> I don't know if I made that up or if someone else said that, but it's just so true. Uh, I think it's actually, I would actually go a little further and say it's dangerous to look at competition because if you, you know, instead of like building something that customers you want you're like copying you know both the failures and the successes but probably a lot of failures of competitors and and you're almost by definition like behind by like a year (laughs) since they already have it live so i just think it's just like completely the wrong approach um yeah great answer rahul what do you think agree disagree Uh, i definitely agree with all of that um and i I think I learned that lesson from Paul Graham. He, he didn't put it quite so eloquently as Ahmad, but he basically said, do not obsess about your competition. Uh, you know, the the startups that die, the, the reasons that startups die are you run out of cash, motivation, uh, or both, right? That Those are the only two reasons, uh, really. And it's not because a competitor does better than you. And if a competitor does do better than you, well, maybe you'll be Lyft to Uber and, and actually you'll still be a great company. So... Uh, definitely agree with all of that. I think Superhuman's in an interesting place. Uh, you know, Mercury clearly has a well-known direct competitor, uh, and it, it awesome that that your product is is so much better. Um, what's sort of actually maybe we're more similar than than I was going to say because Silicon Valley Bank is an incumbent. One of the interesting things about Superhuman is we don't really have a venture-backed competitor. I used to get very scared, like uh, these venture-backed email startups would come and go and they'd come and go. But when they were coming, I'd, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I now have to like send an email to the company or, or send a Slack message to the company about how we're positioned, how they're positioned, how it's different, how everyone needs to to focus and and just uh, you know stay heads down. And, and I don't do that anymore because uh, actually it turns out not to matter we very much do believe in the the Jeff Bezos thing that if you laser focus on your customers, uh, ultimately that's actually all that matters. Fantastic. Okay, I have one more fun question um, and then we're going to wrap. The Mercury team is going to provide a whole bunch of links for follow-up. So there's going to be some content. I believe it's in the chat. So stay tuned for that. Here is the fun follow-up question. It's actually connected to the next Mercury session, which you should all um, attend. And that is around hype cycles and how founders should think about them. So uh, hopefully I'll be invited back to to join this very compelling crew to talk about things like hype cycles. But in this moment, while I have you, let's talk about GPT and LLMs. Um, Is it hypey? Is it real? And, you know, how, if at all, are you thinking about it for your startup? Gene? 
Um, I, I have thought about it a lot. Um, I'm very into GPT and LLMs. And so um, a lot of our value proposition at Akita is you drop us in and you don't have to know anything. You don't have to tell us anything and we start doing things. And so when I saw GPT-3, I was like, wait a minute. It's the same. It looks very different, but um, is you know v- very very similar kind of value proposition. So our team has played with this. Um, we found that actually initial results are pretty good for if you take a bunch of API traffic and you give it to GPT. It's like this is how to make sense of it. Um, my plan had always been build an in-house uh, machine learning team, um, and you know when we when we got to the size and the stability. But to me, this is just incredible because this is a tool in the toolbox that makes it so you could get like two, three engineers and build a feature or at least prototype out a feature around it now. And so I think it's incredibly powerful. People should be thinking of it like Stripe or Twilio. You don't need a whole team to do payments or or SMS now. You can just, you know, you can just outsource your uh, initial AI prototyping. Love it. Rahul, what do you say? Uh, I would say absolutely yes. Uh, we're kind of going about AI in, in maybe a little bit of an anti-hype fashion. Uh, so we're working on a very exciting feature right now, autocorrect. We're all familiar with this. Mac OS does it natively. Uh, we're not building it using LLMs or GPT. It doesn't make sense. to you, know, like you need a super fast in-browser native thing to make that work. Uh, and so... I'm very excited. I have a prototype working on my machine and I'm like already typing twice as fast. So I can't wait to get that into all of your hands. Uh, that said, we are also working on integrating uh, GPT. So it'll, and we're going to start off with the use cases that uh, you're probably familiar with from Notion and Intercom if you've seen their implementation, uh, generating text, transforming text. A lot of that makes a ton of sense. Uh, but in general, I'm I'm super excited. I mean, like, Email is the most text-heavy thing that we all do. We've actually all written about 10 novels. It's kind of absurd how much email we create. So the ability to train on that is, is going to uh, create a ton of use cases that I think we're only just beginning to understand. I love it. Thank you. Imad? Uh, I think about this a lot, especially as I'm a fairly active investor. I think like about half the hype cycles in kind of with VCs and investors are like, kind of fads and BS and about half are like really transformative things. So I think it's worth having your own kind of mindset about like which half you're in when you're in one. Uh, I would, from my perspective, I think AI and LLMs and or any all of this kind of generative AI is transformative and you should like pay attention to it. Uh, yeah, Mercury's applications of it like are probably a little less obvious, like, yeah, maybe in, on fraud, maybe with like analytics, uh, so we're not actively working on it. Uh, if you have a great idea, you know, message me. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely like interested and I think it's real. I love it. Well, look, thank you all. It was a super fun discussion. We didn't get quite as spicy as I'd like, but we'll do that next time. And please check the chat for the links. Please use Akita, Superhuman, and Imad. I'm Anisha Charya, a GP at Andreessen Horowitz. And thank you all for attending. Thank you.